Well, uh, colleagues, friends, visitors, it's a great joy to have you with us in the Senate room uh, where we meet to celebrate special occasions. And this is a special occasion because um, this year we have a series of inaugural lectures by our new professors. And um, it's a special series because we, these, many of these are hope scholars that have served the university for many years and have now emerged at the top highest rank of all the various uh, grades of university staff. So to get a professorship and give an inaugural lecture is a very special moment. I think back when I gave mine, and uh, uh, it was the last time, as uh, Professor Bolt also said, that his father attended. And um, I'm delighted, especially that you have your mom with you tonight. Mothers and fathers think about these things in particular ways, so delighted that uh, she could join us and your family members. May I also say what a special delight it is, because I don't think she's attended any other, is to have the Chancellor. Uh, Professor Monica Grady is here in town for the Foundation Day service this lunchtime and tomorrow's graduation, and being a senior academic herself, she wouldn't miss such an event, and delighted to have you, Professor Grady, with us this evening. I also must say what a joy it is to see my colleague, Professor Ian Vanderbilt. <laughs> Ian, welcome back to home. This is your home, and Ian's footprints are all over the place. And what a joy to see you back on home territory, Ian. Welcome. And all my colleagues, not just um, from um, Caroline's school, but from right across the university. It's always good that we take part in these events. So. I, I, a special welcome, and um, I'm looking forward to this evening and to this lecture. I'm going to invite Professor Kenneth Newport, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, to introduce our speaker, Professor Newport. It's always a great privilege to be asked to say a few words by way of introduction on these occasions, and as always, I'm delighted to have that opportunity. As Professor Pele has said, uh, this academic year, we're able to celebrate the inauguration of actually 13 uh, new professors. And it's particularly pleasing to note that 12 of our new professors have joined the ranks as a result of internal promotion they should not be underestimated. And let me just illustrate uh, why very briefly. About a dozen years ago, we were looking for a new professor of theology. And I was astonished to be called up by a very distinguished scholar who held a named and prestigious chair at a Russell Group University asking about the post. Well, to cut a long story short, I ended up saying, I'm afraid that we do not have an opening for the kind of professorship that you are seeking. Well, basically, it was, I'll come, but only if I can do 80% research, and the other 20% is PhD supervision. That was the package that I was being offered, really. Actually, it would have been a real coup to get that person, but unlike our 13 new professors this year, that person would not have fitted in at Liverpool Hope University. When we look for professors, we're seeking hope people. We're looking for team players who take an interest in the whole community. And that includes students, and that includes undergraduate students, as well as staff. Well, Professor Caroline Wakefield certainly fits that bill. Over the years, she has gained the respect of her colleagues across the sciences and at our wider university. Her infectious cheerfulness and positive disposition are there for all to see. Now, of course, somewhat regrettably, cheerfulness and positivity do not in themselves warrant a personal chair. But let me assure you that in addition to being a really good hope person and a valued colleague, Professor Wakefield does meet all of the standard professorial requirements as well. Caroline received her PhD 
from the University of Liverpool in 2007 with a thesis in the broad area of motor imagery. And since then, she has worked very hard to develop her research further, but also her teaching. Professor Wakefield completed a postgraduate certificate in learning and teaching in higher education and has been a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy since 2017. She was the recipient of the Learning and Teaching Prize here at the university in 2012 and then again in 2019. She is also a qualified secondary teacher. Professor Wakefield's teaching includes research supervision at both masters and doctoral levels and she has been called in as an external PhD examiner at a number of other UK universities. This is in addition to external examinerships at UG at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Professor Wakefield is a BPS chartered psychologist and also a chartered scientist and a registered practitioner with the Health Care Professionals Council. With regard to research, I can but give you just a few prominent headlines for Professor Wakefield's research outputs, conference paper and other dissemination activities long to seven pages I read them through this morning. From my reading of those pages, if I'm not mistaken, Professor Wakefield has published over 35 journal articles, several book chapters, and an edited book. She has presented over 30 conference presentations across 10 countries, including Australia, the USA, China, Canada, Finland, and Spain. Her research Outputs include media appearances, including on the Discovery Channel and the Telegraph and Science Daily. She is a member of the editorial and review board of the journal Imagination, Cognition and Personality. Professor Wakefield is also a regular reviewer and works with over 15 peer-reviewed journals across the areas of sport and exercise psychology, motor control and cognitive psychology. So, as a scholar, as a teacher, as a leader, let us not forget an infectiously cheerful person and a hope colleague in her own words, who in her own words enjoys working at hope because she values, her values align with very, those very closely at the university and because she thrives on interacting with people at the university where the sense of community and collegiality allows that to happen, it's a delight to be able to welcome Professor Wakefield with us this evening. So I need say no more, except to congratulate you, Professor Wakefield, and to invite you now to deliver to us your inaugural lecture on the topic, Possant Queer Posse Bidentur, the role of motor imagery in enhancing performance. Professor Wakefield. Good evening all, and thank you for coming along. One of the first reported references to imagery was written by Virgil in 20 BC. In his poem, he explains that possunt quia posse videnta. These four ancient Latin words translate as they can because they see themselves as being able. Now at the time, that was much more likely a motivational mantra rather than the intentional and structured goal-directed imagery that is the focus of my research and of this talk. But first, to give you a short background. I'm a proud Boltonian, and from the age of 11, attended Rivington and Blackrod High School. And I went to high school with a very clear brief from my parents. And that was to gain A grades across the board in three areas. Attendance, behavior, and effort. You turn up, you behave yourself, and you try your best. And that stood me in good stead for the future, and it's a motto I've tried to live by since. And throughout high school, I was very much, much of a muchness. I kept my head down, I did my homework, I blended in with the crowd. Then when I was in year nine, I got a note from the head of sixth form asking me to come and see him in his office. And this teacher had taught me RE, uh, taught the class RE, one, one hour a week the year before, and that was my only interaction. So as a 14-year-old, I was terrified at this prospect. 
When I arrived and sat down, he said, I've been asked to nominate a leader of tomorrow, and I've chosen you. And he handed me the testimony that he'd written. And my life changed in an instant. Because I wasn't much of a muchness anymore, someone had taken the time to notice. And I knew at that point I belonged in education. I wanted to make a similar difference in the lives of other people. So when it came to choosing A-levels, I did the sensible thing for people who know that they want to teach but don't know who, what or where, and chose maths, English and science, chemistry. And the rest of sixth form was an enjoying and enriching experience, and even resulted in myself and a small team completing a research project on globalization for a national competition. Upon winning, we discovered that the prize was a trip to New York, and we were fortunate enough to sit in the cockpit at sunset as we landed, an experience that will stay with me forever. From there, I gained my first degree from the University of Liverpool, based at what was then Chester College of Higher Education, before completing a PGC in secondary education. Following that course, I decided that my heart and my future lay within academia. So I embarked on a PhD under the guidance and tutelage of Dave Smith and Moira Lafferty. I then did a postdoc year, um, looking at mental health service users. Then I worked at the University of Lincoln, the University of Bolton, before arriving at Liverpool Hope in 2009. Now my PhD examined the area of imagery, and that's an area of enquiry that I've been involved in since. One of our most remarkable cognitive capacities is our ability to simulate sensations, movements, and other types of experience. And for over a century, researchers have investigated the construct of mental imagery. The cognitive simulation process by which we can represent perceptual information in our minds in the absence of related sensory input. Essentially, it's the process of creating or recreating an experience in your mind. And this is something that we've all done. For example, any time you mentally rehearse a presentation, a movement, a situation that you might be facing, that's mental rehearsal. Now, in sport, we use the term motor imagery often, the mental rehearsal of actions without engaging in the actual movements involved. And the difference in terms simply denotes that we're talking about tasks or actions or movements rather than other kinds of tasks. And there are varying types of imagery and varying reasons why athletes in particular might use imagery, depending on the intended function or what they're trying to achieve. And athletes predominantly use imagery um, for motivational or for cognitive reasons. And one such type is cognitive specific imagery, um, where the imagery focuses on the performance of specific skills. And this is the, where the majority of my research has, has been conducted, because it allows very clear and objective measures to be gained about the efficacy of your intervention. So you measure some, somebody's performance, have them engage in an imagery program, measure it again. And you can be fairly confident um, that any changes were as a result of your intervention. And it can eliminate some of the subjectivity involved in measures of things like arousal and motivation. Now, imagery, imagery um, research with a sport-based task dates back to the 1940s, but gained increased momentum in the 1980s um, and the 1990s. And there's a wide range of supporting evidence. Some of the early evidence centered on mental chronometry, which in this context is the time taken um, to do a task compared the time taken to imagine the same task. And it's usually done on, on fairly simple tasks. So very early it was done with walking from one side of the room to the other and back again, and you would be timed to do that. And then they would time you to image the same action with the idea that if those were very close in time, um, it indicated strong level of imagery. Now it's well known in physical practice research that there's an inverse relationship between the difficulty of a task and completion time. So the harder a task is, the longer it takes you to do it. And a group of French psychologists led by Jean Dessity wanted to assess whether the same phenomenon was true of imagery. So they had people doing the tasks, so the walking task, but then they'd have them do it again wearing a weighted vest, more difficult task. They'd have people write a sentence or draw a cube with their dominant hand and then again with their non-dominant hand. They made the task more difficult. And what they found that in, was in each case, the time taken to complete the task when it was more difficult was longer, and that corresponded to an increased time um, to complete the imagery. So suggesting that imagery is very strongly related to overt movement. 
Now, increasing technological advancements have allowed the process to be examined in more detail using EEG, um, PET scanning, fMRI, measuring autonomic responses, blood pressure and heart rate, um, and transcranial magnetic stimulation. And when done properly, imagery can result in actual physical responses. So Smith and Collins, uh, one of my PhD supervisors, assessed the EMG activity on the performance of an abductor task of the Digitai Minimai. Essentially, it's the muscle involved in moving the little finger away from the rest of the hand. And that muscle was chosen because it's not a muscle that's typically trained. So it can be very carefully controlled over the course of your experiment. So everyone just have a go, just rest your hand in on your lap in front of you on the table and just move your little finger of your dominant hand away from the rest of your fingers. Now hold your hand still and really vividly imagine yourself making the same movement. Now in all likelihood, the muscles involved in that movement were just active when you were doing the imagery. Not to a degree you could see, not to a degree you could feel, but if we were to put an EMG trace on there, we would have been able to see um, electrical activity in the muscle. And here's the EMG trace uh, from the experiment by Smith and Collins. This is the muscle activity um, from the physical execution of the task, so when they were actually doing it. And this one um, is the EMG trace from the imagined condition. Now, from where you're sitting, that might look like a straight line. But if you zoom in, it actually mimics the pattern of the trace on the left, but on a much smaller scale, demonstrating low-level muscular activation. And this had a corresponding performance change. So strength gains were significant in the imagery and physical practice conditions from the beginning to the end of the program, with the imagery group producing approximately an increase of half of that of the physical practice group. Now, each of these sources of evidence have pointed to imagery to be a useful performance-enhancing tool. And if you vividly imagine yourself doing a task, you will get better at it. But the research picture isn't as cleanly cut as this. In my experience, they rarely are. It's important to note that this process is not inevitable. And research studies and applied interventions have shown varying results for a number of different reasons. Firstly, relaxation is, and has often been, implemented as a prerequisite to imagery. So this has involved people doing imagery last thing at night, in a darkened room, lying down or sitting down, having their eyes closed, with the idea is that that would minimize the distractions and allow people to focus solely on the task. And although that's intuitively plausible, it isn't supported by empirical evidence for reasons that I'll discuss later. Most of the studies that have used relaxation combined with imagery have not shown a significant performance effect. And those studies that have shown a strong performance effect didn't use relaxation. A further question concerns the personalization or the individualization of imagery scripts. So typically imagery scripts have been produced by the practitioner or the researcher and supplied to all of the, practitioner, all of the participants as a prompt. So participants work off the same script. The key difficulty here is although the stimulus of the environment might be the same, the athlete's responses to the task, so the emotional, perceptual, physiological responses, and indeed the meaning that they attach to those responses are likely to differ from one another. Therefore, if, imagery, if the mechanism supporting imagery's use is about shared neural correlates, which I will argue later that it is, then it's important to in increase each individual's sharedness. Now, that these processes have more recently been studied in cognitive neuroscience, sports psychology, motor learning, and rehabilitation science. And this convergence of interdisciplinary research interest in motor imagery centers around the functional equivalence hypothesis. The discovery from neuroimaging studies of similar cortical neuronal activity prior to and during both imagery and physical practice. Essentially, if you vividly imagine an action, similar areas of the brain are active as if you were physically completing it. Now, this concept of functional equivalence can be traced back as at least as far as James in 1890 who claimed that sensation and imagination are due to activity of the same centers of the cortex. More formally, however, the term functional equivalence was pioneered by Fink, who postulated that one can think of mental images as being functionally equivalent to physical objects or events. In sports psychology, an early advocate of functional equivalence 
was the late, great Professor Aidan Moran, my PhD external examiner from UCD, who in reviewing the research on mental practice suggested that imagery is covert simulation of perceptual experience. Now to enhance this functional equivalence and have an optimal performance effect, Holmes and Collins divide the pe devised the PETLEP model of motor imagery. Now PETLEP is an acronym with each letter standing for an important practical consideration for imagery interventions to enhance the sharedness of the neural processes. And these are physical, environment, task, timing, learning, emotion, and perspective. Physical refers to the athletes physically recreating um, the performance. So this could include completing their imagery whilst they're adopting the right, the, the right stance or holding any implements that they might hold, perhaps wearing the correct clothing, and this further emphasizes why imagery and relaxation as a combination are not likely to maximize performance improvements. Performing imagery, imagery in a relaxed state is contradictory to what we know about the relatively high arousal states displayed by athletes, particularly in competitive settings. The environment component refers to the physical environment where the athlete will perform their imagery. And this should be as similar as possible to the actual performance environment. Where that's not possible, videotapes, photographs um, can be used to facilitate the imagery. The task component refers to the task itself, which should be as similar as possible, if not identical, to the actual task. And this will be dependent on the ability level of the participant. For example, if you have a novice rifle shooter, their imagery, it, the primary components of their imagery might be centered on the positioning of the feet and the trunk, whereas a more elite performer might um, be sent to their imagery on the more intricate movements. The timing components of the model refers to the pace of the imagery. And whilst it seems intuitive during a learning phase to slow down movements, timing is critical to the production of skilled movements. And therefore, a real-time pace will serve to increase the functional equivalence. The learning component is concerned with the mirroring of the imagery with the skill level and updating as necessary. So over a medium time period, improvements are likely to be seen in the execution of the skill and the imagery script should be reflected um, in that to ensure that that functional equivalence is maintained. The emotion component involves encouraging the athletes to include all of the emotions that they would typically feel during performance. So things like nerves or excitement. And again, these will be highly individualized from athlete to athlete. And finally, the perspective component which refers to the perspective being taken. And this can either be first-person perspective, you image as though you're looking through your own eyes and you can see what you see through your own eyes, or the third-person perspective, as though you're watching yourself on a TV screen, as though you're doing it over there somewhere. The, the idea of maintaining functional equivalence would suggest that a first-person perspective is preferable, because that's what you would see during performance. But research has shown that particular form-based skills a third person perspective might be useful. So if you have a young gymnast with a complex tumbling rate, um, routine, there's very little point them imaging through their own eyes. They, they would just see a blur. They'd be able to access a greater amount of information if they imaged as a third person perspective. Now following the completion of the model, the authors called for systematic testing in a variety of settings, which gave rise to my PhD study. Alongside the early stages of my PhD study, I was involved in a research study, which proved to be my first foray into imagery research and was the first systematic testing of the PETLEP model. This two study paper looked at the effects of PETLEP based imagery compared to more traditional kind of relax and visualize imagery interventions. Study one looked at varsity hockey players and study two elite junior gymnasts, uh, completing a full turning jump on the beam. And in study one, participants either completed sports-specific imagery, which followed the PETLEP guidelines, or traditional imagery um, for a six-week period. And results showed that the sports-specific group scored significantly higher than the traditional group. In the second study, in this paper, we also were interested in the performance effects of physical practice. How far did imagery go in mimicking those effects that we might see? So here, participants were split into four groups. A physical practice group who performed the task, a PETLEP imagery group who followed the PETLEP guidelines, a traditional imagery group, 
um, that focused only on the stimulus of the situation and a control group. And both physical practice and pet lab groups improved significantly from pre-test to post-test, but with no significant difference between them. The group that had completed only pet lab imagery had shown the same performance improvements than those who had physically practiced the skill in this population. Now, taken together, these results provided the first early testing and support for the pet lab model. And this resultant article has now been cited over 300 times in academic uh, journals, but more importantly, fur further developed my interest in the area. Now, during this time, I also completed my PhD, which consisted of four studies. The first two focused on pet lab imagery and its efficacy compared to traditional imagery across two tasks of varying cognitive complexity. So the first of these two studies was a strength-based task, very high motor components, very low cognitive components. And participants were assigned to one of five groups, pet lab um, imagery, traditional imagery, physical practice, control, and in this study, we also included a combination group because that's what athletes do. They wouldn't just physically practice the skill, they wouldn't just image a skill, they would likely do a combination of the two. And the participants in the pet lab groups completed their imagery whilst watching a first-person perspective video. And the results showed that the pet lab group, the combination group, and the physical practice groups improved, whereas the other groups did not. And the improvements that we showed were large. The mean percentage increase in weight lifted was 23.29% in the pet lab imagery group. These are people who'd come to the lab, they'd sat at a weights machine, in the right clothing, and they'd imagine themselves lifting weights whilst watching a video. 23% increase in bicep strength over a six week period. Study two examined imagery in a task with a large cognitive component and a low motor component. Participants were again randomly assigned to one of four groups, pet lip imagery group, traditional imagery group, physical practice group, and a control. And the results showed that the pet lip imagery group Again, and the physical practice group improved significantly from pre-test to post-test, thus strongly supporting the use of PETLEP in enhancing performance of a cognitive task. Now, contrary to previous studies, PETLEP was as effective as physical practice. It mirrored what we saw um, in, in the previous study of my PhD, but went against a lot of the other literature around at the time. And this finding can have really important implications for athletes returning from injury, those suffering from um, overtraining, and those suffering from burnout. If there's a mechanism by which they can retain a performance effect without physically practicing a skill, that would be useful for all of those groups. By then, we were beginning to develop a picture about the type and structure of imagery that would be most beneficial, but not the specifics of its implementation. Therefore, studies three and four of my PhD focused on, opt uh, on ascertaining the optimal frequency of imagery over two very different timescales, four weeks and 22 weeks. And in both cases, the results demonstrated that as the frequency of imagery increased, a larger performance effect was apparent. Now, following my PhD, I was keen to ex further extend the understanding of this area with a range of skilled movements and population groups. So we first showed that it was beneficial in elite golfers, completing bunker shots. And we then further explored this outside of the sporting arena and broadened it out to nursing. As part of pre-registration training, nurses are required to be examined on a variety of skills, using objective structured clinical examinations, the OSCEs. Therefore, we employed imagery as a pet lab, base, uh, pet lab imagery as a simulation-based training method for completing two of those skills, aseptic technique, which is a procedural readying of sterile equipment, and blood pressure measurement. And results revealed that the students who use pet lab training for blood pressure measurement performed significantly better than those who did not. However, the training did not have an effect for the aseptic techniques. Now this might be because the blood pressure measurement is a highly skilled motor task whereas the aseptic technique relies more heavily on the recollection of procedure and therefore perhaps didn't follow the same neural firing pattern each time it was completed. Now, in addition to completing empirical lab-based research, I've also been heavily involved in the production of review papers, including one on timing, 
Others applying imagery to nursing and the arts. And a 15-year review of the PetLet model. Now, the latter focused on what we termed behavioural matching. So the PetLet model itself was originally grounded in the concept of functional equivalence, the idea that imagery activates similar regions of the brain to motor planning and execution. But given that PetLet-based imagery and movement execution processes can never truly be functionally equivalent, indeed we didn't measure neural processes um, during the, the tasks, in the review paper we proposed that a more accurate explanation might be that it provides a closer behavioural match than previous imagery types. Now, this is the paper to date that I'm most proud of, not because we made any substantial new discoveries, but because my co-authors were people and, and their work that I'd admired from the beginning of my PhD, and now I was in a position to be publishing alongside them. As time progressed, the field of study began to more closely examine other interventions that were also thought to have a similar neural overlap with physical performance. And one which stood out was action observation, or the deliberate and structured observation of successful um, motor skill execution. And we had implemented some observation methods earlier in this body of work by using video-assisted imagery, but this was a much more formal integration. Now, although distinct brain structures are identifiable for action observation and motor imagery individually, there is a degree of neural overlap between them and between each of them and motor execution. And while the vast majority of previous literature has focused on imagery and action observation in isolation, there's now an emerging body of research showing the potential advantages of completing them together. So you image whilst you're observing a skill. And building on these well-established findings, researchers now turn to investigate the effects of their combined use. Now, action observation studies have been typically framed as observe whilst you're doing the action, doing them together, or observe with the intent to imitate the action, doing one and then the other. And therefore, we mapped imagery onto this intervention where imagery took the place of physical practice. So that left us with different groups. Participants would either observe and image at the same time, what we call simultaneous imagery, or observe with the intent to image, observe and image one after the other, which we term, termed alternate action observation and motor imagery. And the idea was that while simultaneous imagery and action observation, doing them together, might assist with some of the task characteristics, so timing might be made easier in the imagery if you have the observation at the same time, alternate action observation um, and motor imagery might be more useful for people with limits on their working memory capacity, so elderly populations or clinical populations. So for those people, completing imagery and observation together would create too much information for them to effectively attend to. In the first of this series of studies, we looked at throwing performance. And results revealed that all of the intervention groups, with the exception of action observation, significantly improved following the intervention. And the simultaneous group and alternate group improved um, to the greatest degree, but there was no significant difference between them. So it looks like the efficacy of the combined groups um, combining action observation and motor imagery, regardless of how they're combined, might be the most beneficial method. But performance itself, is a, uh, particularly in a target task, is a relatively crude measure. So in the second of these series of studies, we wanted to, to find, in, find out what underpins the facilitative effect on performance that we'd seen. So we looked at the same skill with the same groups, but with the addition of biomechanical markers. We measured muscle activation of the upper and forearm muscles, and angular velocity and peak angular velocity um, of the elbow of the throwing arm. And again, the performance of the two combined groups um, improved significantly. Now, interestingly, what we found in these groups was that there was also a corresponding reduction in mean muscle activation of the tricep brachii and bicep brachii, as well as a decrease in peak angular velocity. Essentially, the movement became more efficient in the combined um, conditions. And this reaffirmed the benefits of action observation and motor imagery together for facilitating skill learning, particularly in relation to EMG and movement kinematics. In the third study, we were interested in the precise nature of the observed task. What is it about the observation that's improving performance? 
Was it just that they were observing something or did it have to be corresponding to the action itself? So in this one, we had a group um, of, of um, participants who performed the imagery of the throwing action whilst observing a congruent video. So they imaged the throwing action and they observed a video of the, themselves doing the same action. And we expected this to lead to the largest performance effects. We'd seen this in previous studies. We had another group that observed the throwing, the image, sorry, the throwing action, but observed a fixation cross. We asked them to just look in one point during the observation. And we predicted that this would have a, a lesser performance effect, but still a performance effect due to the imagery component. And then in the third group, we had them observing an incongruent video. So whilst they were imaging a throwing action, we had them um, observe a video using the same muscles, but moving in a different plane. So they observed a video of somebody doing that. And we expected that this would have either no or a negative effect on performance because of an interference effect. But results showed that only the congruent observation led to improvement in the performance. So they had to be observing the same tasks that they were imaging in order to have that performance improvement. And the only reason that this was so surprising to us was the lack of improvement in the fixation cross group. So this group were doing imagery and they weren't watching anything that should interfere, but they didn't show an improvement. And one suggestion that we gave for the limited improvement in that group was that the eyes weren't able to move freely, which might limit the efficacy of the imagery itself and suggest that vision might pay an important, play an important role in image formation. So we then looked at the role of vision and the production of effective imagery um, experiences. And this has come a full circle because we did this using mental chronometry, which I discussed earlier. And we examined the importance of retinal and extra retinal information on the performance of simple sequential movements. So we tracked their eyes whilst they were doing the imagery. And we were interested at this point in broadening it out to more clinical um, populations. So we didn't want to use sport skills. Instead, we used four, um, four activities of daily living in the Southampton Hand Assessment Procedure. So it looks like this. So you'll see there up in the top left, um, these activities of daily living are things like turning a key, um, pulling a handle, doing a zip. So activities that you might see in rehabilitation settings. And they imagined completing the tasks under three different conditions. Free eye movements and visible objects, the targets were in front of them, they did their imagery. Free eye movements, but no visibility of the objects. So we put a screen that occluded um, the targets. And one, uh, a third condition where we constrained their eye movements. So they could see the objects in the periphery, but we asked them to focus again on a fixation cross. And what we found was that the imagery was less accurate just when the eyes were constrained. So when they, they could move their eyes freely, it didn't matter whether they could see the target that they were moving to or not, they could still mimic effective performance that they couldn't when the, um, when the eyes were constrained. And this highlights the crucial role that eye movements can play in the regulation, particularly the temporal aspects of imagery, even when retinal information is absent. And we've since produced work looking at the spatial characteristics of aiming, um, under a variety of imagery conditions um, in relation to physical practice. In terms of future research directions we're currently looking at, firstly we'll examine mental chronometry in more detail as an indicator of imagery ability. At the moment, to, to ascertain someone's imagery ability, you have them fill out a questionnaire and self-report their ability, um, which is not a particularly useful indicator. So we're going to utilize TMS and mental chronometry to establish a new protocol and allow it to be measured in a more objective way. We've also just begun a series of studies to examine the optimal frequency and amount of imagery. So previous studies, just like mine in my PhD work, have shown that imagery, completing imagery three times a week leads to stronger performance improvements than once or twice a week. But one of the difficulties here is that the participants in the three times a week group are completing more imagery. So it might be a case of amount rather than frequency that's having the impact. So we have a series of studies set up where the absolute amount of intervention completed is controlled and the frequency um, is manipulated. 
And finally, it'd be interesting to consider the use of various permutations of imagery and its applications in clinical populations. So Parkinson's disease, post-surgery immobilization, and stroke rehabilitation. Now, I mentioned in the synopsis of this talk that I would also touch more broadly on my other areas of research and applied interest. As academics generally, but specifically at a university with the values of hope, we have a broader obligation to consider how we can positively impact the community, the world, and the lives of other people. And we did this, myself and Moira Lafferty from the University of Chester, did this using sports teams initiation. When joining sports teams at university or beyond, it's typical for students to engage in initiation ceremonies or rites of passage, what you might have heard called hazing. And these usually include excessive alcohol consumption, substance misuse, um, sexualized behavior, bullying, harassment, and participation in risky challenges designed to humiliate. And these can range from the very positive welcome events right down to what you might know of, of hazing. And we've heard lots of, of relatively extreme studies, so involving students um, consuming large amounts of alcohol and then engaging in tasks that make them dizzy, but they do it on the top of multi-storey car parks, under bridges, the side of canals. Those students participating are clearly at risk of physical and psychological harm, but also a social and academic harm. We've spoken to intending teachers and medics who've got criminal records, which will jeopardize their future careers. And this also has a broader effect on students reporting dropping out of or not partaking in university sport because of the fear and consequences of such activities. Now, following a spate of student deaths as a result of partaking in sporting initiations, the Tynmouth report recommended that universities should adopt a zero tolerance mandate and formulate an agreement with the National Union of Students and British University College Sport to this effect. Despite these risks and the adoption of a mandatory zero tolerance policy within universities, students report continuation of initiation ceremonies, which they claim increase cohesion and uphold tradition. And following the death of Ed Farmer, a university in the Northeast, um, the coroner called for a national campaign to address these risks. So as a result of this, we researched the topics of initiations in UK universities. The first in the series of studies examined the prevalence of initiation and team building activities in UK based population, something that hadn't been done in the UK before, alongside measures of cohesion. And the research findings showed that initiations still remain commonplace across university sport, particularly in, in interacting team sports, so traditional uh, rugby, football, hockey. But the results demonstrated that these inappropriate behaviours were not related to cohesion of the team unit, which challenged the common reasoning given by students for engaging in these activities, which is to enhance team spirit and build cohesion. We then completed a further study utilizing interviews with student athletes to gain qualitative data um, on students' experiences of initiation uh, events. And this revealed that students perceived initiations to be a discrete but necessary stage to overcome in order to become an accepted member of a team. And furthermore, all of the initiation um, stories outlined to us had a direct or indirect link to alcohol, alcohol consumption, health and behavioral related risks as a result of participating. So what we did was we wove the um, interview data together um, to form comprehensive narratives of initiation experiences, which we filmed using actors and were backlit to imitate a witness statement and minimize distractions. And these narratives then form the central component of an initiation workshop, aiming to challenge inappropriate and risk behaviors. We wanted to develop an understanding amongst student officers about the potential risks for harm, and we wanted them to hear it in the words of their peers. We wanted to develop a tool for meaningful behavior change. So we call this the changes intervention, challenging, hazing, and negative group events in sport. Following the development of the intervention, we obtained backing from books who, re who referenced the collaboration in a press release, explaining that it's the first program of its kind to be developed and implemented in higher education. 
Subsequent meetings with senior and regional management resulted in the intervention being formally endorsed by BUCS and currently formed part of their inclusion agenda. Now, the intervention itself was highlighted as an example by UK, uh, Universities UK, where a consensus on dealing with initiation um, activities was obtained by stakeholders, and the briefing recommends that the university should collaborate with the changes intervention to empower students and to hold each other accountable uh, for inappropriate or dangerous behaviours. Then we set off over two very busy Septembers, we set off on a road trip covering as much of the UK as the two of us could cover. And we delivered the workshop at 25 universities with participation from just over a thousand student officers, consisting of club um, and team captains. Now each of these officers holds responsibility for 10 to 15 student athletes. Therefore the intervention has potentially impacted 10 to 15,000 students. And this has had a significant and direct impact on the behaviour of student athletes nationally. So the workshop has an inbuilt transportation measure. We can measure people's changes in thoughts and, and the changes in their behaviours. But we also collected some testimonials from institutions who have attested that they noticed a marked improvement in complaints with zero recorded since the intervention. Several institutions also recognised a change in culture citing that the intervention led to an increased dialogue between the university and the students around initiations. And clubs were more receptive to working with the unions in creating a more positive and welcome environment. This was echoed by the books, representation, uh, books representative who confirmed that since the changes intervention was rolled out, they've noted a decrease in initiation related activities and an increase in well-being outcomes. So to conclude, the intervention and changing the cultures of initiations in this way has raised awareness and reduced risk behaviours, allowing a more inclusive agenda, and which will hopefully enrich the lives of student athletes and have immeasurable health and social and wellbeing benefits. It's an ongoing labour of love and important work that we intend to continue both with, both in the long and short term future. Now that's about it for my talk. Um, but before I finish, I would like to offer my sincere thanks to you all for coming along this evening. Um, it really means a lot. And if you'll indulge me, I have some personal thanks also. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Vice-Chancellor, Deputy Vice-Chancellors, members of USET for bestowing this honour on me. I have felt at home at Hope since I first arrived, and that's a real testament to the environment that you've created here. I'd like to thank my mentors, um, both formal and informal, Dave Smith, Moira Lafferty, Ian Vanderval, Sue Beecroft, Penny Horn, Omid Kayat, who have all shown an unwavering belief in me and my academic abilities. Um, it makes a real difference to be surrounded by successful and supportive and friendly and occasionally critical voices. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, past and present, many of whom I think of as friends, there hasn't been a working day where I've woken up and not wanted to come to work. And I'm yet to meet another group of people as driven and hardworking as, and as supportive as they are. It's a genuine pleasure to work alongside them every day. I'd like to thank my family and friends uh, for their support, particularly my mum, dad, brother Stephen, sister Abigail, and one of my dearest friends, Sarah, who is here today. We were raised with a very positive view of education and an environment of strong work ethics. Um, and as a result of that, my brother is now a planning policy manager for a local authority. And my sister, at the time of her appointment, was the youngest head teacher in the country. All three of us have been wholeheartedly and lovingly supported in whatever we've chosen to do. And it's a real privilege. Two more than I've done. Hold on. I'd like to thank my husband, Phil. Phil and I met three weeks before we started our own undergraduate degrees. Um, and for those of you who have experience with first year students will know that students that arrive at university with girlfriends or boyfriends from home usually see their relationships last until about Thursday of induction week. But here we are, 22 years later. Uh, Phil is the backbone of our family and any success that I have is a reflection of the both of us. And finally, I'd like to thank our children, Imogen and Oliver. They have brought more joy and laughter 
and challenge and purpose to our lives than we thought possible. So to the academic community, I'm Professor Wakefield, but to them, I'm just mummy. And I'm incredibly proud of both of those titles. Thank you so much again for coming along. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Uh, last part of uh, lecture always makes everyone very emotional. Uh, I had the same experience. So uh, uh, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to uh, respond to uh, Caroline's uh, inaugural lecture today. Sport and exercise science uh, has revolved over the decades, as such, it has turned into an important multidisciplinary uh, field in terms of teaching, research, and practice. Even within its own traditional boundaries, sport and exercise science has always been a well-defined interdisciplinary area comprising exercise physiology, sport biomechanics, physical activity and health, and sport psychology. Sport psychology is a very fundamental component of sport and exercise science, striving hard to investigate and improve athletic performance by seeking an appropriate balance between physiological and psychological dimensions of performance. As we heard from uh, Professor Wakefield today, sports psychology and interrelated research, including motor imagery techniques, play a substantial role in uh, the assessment, training, and rehabilitation of the athletes with the main purpose of stabilizing and enhancing their sporting performance. Today's lecture and related uh, literature indicate that a considerable number of top athletes, nearly 70 to 90% of professional athletes use imagery very extensively to build on their strengths and to eliminate their weaknesses so they can elevate performance and perform more effectively. The use of uh, motor imagery techniques is particularly popular in some sports basketball, football, swimming, gymnastics, volleyball, dance, to name a few. We also learned today that imagery not only helps athletes to regulate their anxiety during competitions, but also helps them to stay confident, focused, and mentally tough during the competition. Imagery interventions positively affect athletes' psychological states by decreasing anxiety level and enhancing self-confidence self-efficacy, and concentration. Today's lecture enforced the significant role of sport psychology and motor imagery in enhancing sport performance. But in the same time, it delivered a clear message that further research is essential to help better understand the underpinning science, the activity of the brain in particular. To identify individual differences in creating vivid motor imagery across athletes, to overcome challenges in the appropriate and valid measurement of the motor imagery, and more importantly, to establish a stronger evidence for development and implementation of effective interventions, not only in athletes, but also, as Caroline mentioned, potential in some devastating conditions like Parkinson's and stroke. These topics are the much needed areas of motor imagery practice for further investigations and explorations. Professor Wakefield's current re uh, future research focused on these topics with a particular emphasis on the integration of motor imagery and action observation, known as AOMI. A very viable interdisciplinary approach, indeed based on neurophysiological and behavioral evidence available to us these days. Professor Wakefield also briefly touched on a different dimension of her research, the changes intervention. This was uh, transformed into a strong impact case study and became a nationally recognized initiative to safeguard a large number of students eager to join university sport clubs from being harmed in different ways, physically, mentally, and socially. A kind of wider influence right within the core of Hope's missions and values. I witnessed 
extensive amount of research work is spent to establish the underpinning evidence for the, this intervention and numerous journeys across the country to promote and implement it. A long but extremely fruitful journey. If I'm being totally honest, I learned about Caroline's research in the last 60 minutes more than what I've learned over nearly a decade of working together. So thank you for that. I've always admired Caroline for being an ambitious, highly committed and professional colleague, and I offer my warmest congratulations for, her, for this excellent achievement. Thank you. Well, colleagues, it's fascinating to hear what my colleagues are doing. And you're right, uh, Professor Kai, it's, it's times like this when you sit down and listen to what our colleagues are doing. Of course, I know what Caroline does. And I've been reading her CV on more than one occasion. But it's just good to hear you articulate your thinking. I wish I, I, wish I knew all this when I was still an aspiring squash player, <laughs> which I'm afraid I've had. With, I could have done just a little bit better, Caroline, if I knew this. Uh, but over and above the impact on the physical, surely, if what you say is true about the physical, just having a sense of imagining the best will help us mentally as well in the way we carry ourselves and imagine the future. Just think of the impact on mental health, because mental health this will have over and above physical capacity. Wonderful, and thank you so much for sharing that. But often about the academics of all this, let me tell you, colleagues, that in Caroline Wakefield, we just have a wonderful colleague. I've never, ever talked to Caroline and felt depressed. She's positive by nature, and she embraces the life of the university, and certainly the life of this university. And she's an uplifting colleague and puts on the light when you come into a room, Caroline. So congratulations. We're very, very proud of you as a university. Now, there is a little gift we give our professors on occasions like this. If you would come forward, please. To mark the occasion. Congratulations. Thank you. 